My name is Daniel Ewerman, and this is the Service Design Show. With the Service Design Show, we help you to stay one step ahead by talking to the people that are shaping the service design field. We talk about the current state of the industry, exciting new developments, and the challenges up ahead. My guest in this episode is Daniel Jorman. Daniel is the founder and director of Transformator Design. He's the author of a book called Customer Experience, Why Some Organizations Fail and Others Don't. And he told me about a cloud-based product that they've recently launched called Customers. Make sure you check out that. In this episode, we'll be talking about things like why organizations fail to put customers at the center of their business, why service designers shouldn't be designing services but organizations, and finally, about a thing called dynamic customer journeys. If you want to fast forward to one of these topics, check out the episode guide in the description or just stick around and enjoy the whole episode. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Welcome to the show, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Daniel, let's, uh, let's uh, kick off and ask me the, uh, ask the question that I'm asking everyone. What is your very first memory of service design? Because you've been in the industry for so long. My very first memory was then when we worked with uh, Scania commercial vehicles. Uh, you know, those trucks, trucks from Sweden. Uh, we were traveling around Europe interviewing a lot of haulage owners and, uh, and drivers uh, when working with Scania's uh, product identity. And the, the customers started to talk about not owning a truck, but more using a truck. So the customers they, of Scania were asking that? Customers of yeah. Scania didn't talk about, they, they didn't really they didn't saw really the value in owning the truck. They more saw the value in using the truck. Mm. And when iterating this together with them in many of the European countries, um, it was quite clear that they wanted a service from Scania in which there was a truck. And for us, that was pretty new. This was uh, 99. And we started to try out our methods about design strategy on creating services uh, and started to create services there for, for those uh, customers like uh, repair and maintenance agreements, um, driver training, uh, buyback agreements or uh, rent, uh, rent trucks uh, for a short period. Or, um, so that was my first uh, what Was it called service say. design? Did you order? Did you have a different name for it back then uh, in '99? We called it more design of services. Design so it was service design, but just in a different order. We called it yeah. design services, and and the managers there at Scania, um, actually, he the, the person that really realized how the the impact of this. I was pretty young, younger than today <laughs> at that time. Uh, he's now the CEO of uh, Volvo Cars, so he was a bright guy. His name is mm. Håkan Samuelsson, mm. and and he, he he saw that those young guys here they had they had some great ideas that w was more about the service logic than the product ownership logic. Mm. Uh, but we didn't call it service design, but design for services. So uh, of course now every car manufacturer is moving into the mobility and service business, but we yeah. can say that Scania was way ahead of its time back then. Yeah, they were. Yeah, mm. they were way ahead of the time. And I think that the reason for that was that they, they are a, a premium brand. Uh, they are more expensive, uh, maybe high quality, and, and more ex which do that they have more demanding customers. And the, the, the more demanding customers, they... They, they run into this earlier yeah. than yeah. the competitors' customers. They, they are higher up in the value chain, yeah. I guess. Yeah. yeah. Well, 1999, interesting. So, um, Daniel, uh, let's explain to the people that are uh, watching the show for the very first time, especially to see you, how this uh, format works, right? Uh, we do it in co-creation, uh, the show, and I have a stack of cards with some topics written on it. 
uh, desire. And you also have a stack of papers, right? I Somewhere have a stack on of your papers. desk. Here. Here they are. Yeah, well, exactly. Those kind of yeah. things. I'll uh, hold up a topic in a minute and you'll hold up a question starter, what I call them. And we'll co create a question from there on and talk about it for a few minutes. Perfect. Th that's it. Yeah. So, Daniel, let's start off with this one. And this topic is called Customers at the Center. Yep. What question goes along with this one? Then I show you this one. Why? And why, do we have a question? Why organizations fail to put the customer at the center of the business? So why do organizations fail? That's interesting. Why do they fail? Mm, there are some different reasons why they fail. Um, one is that they have a bad bad connection or maybe bad anchor uh, between customer empathy and the business. So they don't prove that empathy leads to better business. And with a bad connection, it's hard, it, it would be a nice to have. Uh, well, what is a good connection? A good connection is proving um, uh, how Doing better for our customers will lead to more a more efficient organization and uh, maybe higher market shares or higher incomes or what well, to, to connect it to the numbers or the, the figures that really matters in that organization. I guess that's one of the hardest things to do in service design at this moment. Yeah, that's hard, and I think it's very important to do it to show to, to show it to have systems to do it and. Um, to, I, I think it's, it's really worth the time and sometimes the fight to really get it through to yeah. show this. But there are more, there are more reasons. Yeah. Um, I would say that weak customer insights, maybe. It's one of the, the most important that when you, when you have weak customer insights, when they're not done in, the, in, in a proper way, it will become very easy for people internally to question those and start to run their own agenda. Hmm. Because why should, we, why should we use those customer insights? I don't really believe them. Oh, so let me ask a question again. What do you consider strong customer insights? Uh, strong customer insights, I would say those that are where you co-create together with customers uh, the problem definition, not only the solution. So, together with, uh, and then I mean end, end users, end customers, mm -hmm. together with the end customers, um, define what's really the problem or what could be the opportunity here, um, instead of just making up internally or um, doing um, maybe focus groups, so that kind of way where you just more understand how people act in a group, mm. you understand the mm. group dynamics, yeah. but you won't understand who, how people will will uh, decide when uh, when it's a real situation when they go to buy something. But, but getting those strong uh, customer insights, um, it, it's it requires a bigger investment up front, right? You yeah. need to put more time and effort into this, and yes. selling this is yeah. is maybe. A real challenge it is a real challenge. I think that a lot of organizations have come to the conclusion that the, the old ways doesn't seem to show uh, the, the real, um, it doesn't seem to give the, the input uh, or the base for the development that they really need. So they're willing to try something new. And when trying something new, they see that it works much better. Mm. Uh, and uh, so that's, I mean, that's one, uh, one reason why they fail, I would say. But uh, the, there are more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are more reasons. Yeah, give me one more. So, um, I, I would say that many organizations fail because they have a very bad uh, distribution of the ownership of the customer experience. Who is really responsible for the customer experience? And who have the mandate 
and what, what budgets do they have, what should they achieve, when and where. And I think it's important for all organizations today to, to, that want to, to put the, the customers at the heart of the business, that they, they, they distribute the ownership in a good way, just as they do with other important stuff in the, in the organization. Like? How do you compare this? Like uh, development, sales, or different business areas, or where All it's right. very clear how they have distributed the ownership. Who is responsible for achieving what? Hmm. And they have to do the same with the customer experience. And that's, that's I would say, is one important reason. Hmm. Um, yeah. Well, I... Uh, what is your insight on this? Because uh, should uh, customer experience be centralized in some kind of place within the organization, or how should it be distributed? What is your what are your latest thoughts on that? Organizations are so different, so I think it's hard to to just say one the best and the the, the right way to do it. I think it's up to the organization. Uh, <laughs> I think that um, just by having a kind of internal go-to guy called the customer experience manager, I yeah. don't really think that will solve, solve stuff. That's yeah. a good start. Yeah. I think uh, um, there have to be organized the same way as other important stuff are, are taken care of in the business. So it's very different from some, in some organizations it's, it's really good to have someone in the management on the management C level that are really customer experience responsible. In other organizations better to have it in each uh, business unit. Mm. Uh, so, and, and some it's, it's better to share it up between sales, marketing and de development. So at, at least I have to think about it and uh consider it actively how they are going to yeah. distribute it. Right, yeah. so bef before we move on to the second topic, let's recap you. Why do organizations fail? They fail because, what was your first item? They... Uh, bad connection. Between, bad connection. Uh, between the customer empathy. Um, second one was... Uh, I don't remember actually. Yeah, yeah the customer, <laughs> weak customer it? insights. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was weak customer one. insights and, then and bad distribution. And the bad about. distribution, right? Yeah, and, and uh, I guess the, lo the list is it's it's. I mean, it's it's, it's long, but yeah, maybe if I just I just have to mention one more because it's so important. Go I mean, ahead. <laughs> unclear and unengaging decisions. I mean, it's when, a pretty bold statement. What do you mean with that? I mean, there there have to be much more. Uh, empathy put in into to the decisions, so that the the C level people understand really with the, with their heart what they are deciding upon. And I think that's where service designers really could could design good decisions uh, in a good way. So organizations feel for the decision and commit to the decision and don't just make the decisions. Well, maybe maybe a lot of organizations aren't driven by the heart, but maybe by the mind or. But everybody, I, I mean, all I haven't met any people internally in no organizations that don't want the best for the customers. So it's a strange world we live in, right? So there, there, there are there are a few disconnects there. Yeah. Yeah. We have to move on, uh, Daniel, to the second topic yeah, because yeah. time is flying by. Oh, well, uh, maybe you can elaborate or continue because this second topic uh, is called designing organizations. Great, yeah. Do you have a question that goes along with that I one? I have yeah. a question here and it's called why, why again? Why service design shouldn't design services but organizations? You're, you're making things even more complex. We're trying <laughs> yeah, to sorry, simplify sorry. things. <laughs> yeah. Um, Why should we I be mean, designing there's no, organizations? There's, there's yeah. no need for good service design if the organization can't embrace it and, and uh, make it true and make it come to life. And uh, the only way to, to get a service really uh, come true 
and really meet the end user and end customer is to design the service organization that is going to deliver this service. Mm -hmm. Which means that we service designers can't anymore design services. We have to design service organizations. What, what are the, can you name a few aspects that have to be designed? What do you see, what do you mean with designing organizations? Um, for instance, when starting to think about putting the customer at the center, a lot of organizations, well, a lot of people internally in, in large organizations, they, they think, well, we don't have even time to do what we, we are doing today. Shall we now start to think about the customers as well? You're crazy. And the reason for that, why they think so, is that they think that customer centricity and service design will add on more job for them. Mm -hmm. But it's just as important to understand what can we stop doing. We have to, we service design have to be much better in um, understanding uh, what organizations can stop doing today because there's no value for the customer right. at all in it. And that will free up a lot of resources to focus on what they should do. And that's a way to start to design the organization. What should we stop do? What should we start do? Um, another thing is that I think we service designers have to be much better in bridging the gap between development and administration. Because usually there's a lot of money in development. That's where service designers are. There's money there, we develop new stuff, and then at a certain time this service is, is, is ready to go on to the administration. And the administration that there's no money uh, there because we're just going to run the business and maybe do some continuous improvement and that kind of stuff. But I think we have to bridge the gap. So, so, so help me out here. We, we, we've done our user research, we've done our co-creation sessions, we've come up with some great new service concepts. Maybe we've even prototyped one, of, one or two of these concepts. And then a lot of service design projects stop, right? Yeah. And you're yeah. saying that's the point where we should get better? That's the point where we should be much better in understanding how the organization works and how they can embrace this what's the best for this organization and we have to understand on what level can they start to realize uh, or make reality of those concepts that we have developed both in the development uh, internally but also in the administration to engage people in the in the administration hmm. uh, for instance set the, i mean one one very very practical way is to set up um, we have called them greenhouses or uh, that kind of uh, internal uh, different uh, apartments which in the day-to-day -day work test the new stuff in the reality. That's the All way right. to work with the organization and then make that extremely transparent for others, other people in the organization. And um, so... But I guess the, the most challenging part in this is getting our organizations so far that they are willing to create the time and space and resources to set up these kind of greenhouses, right? Or is it pretty easy? They challenge the... They, they have... I mean, organizations that have experienced service design, which I, I would say that many have today, they have seen the challenge with implementation. Yeah. So they know that they have to try out new ways to implement stuff. Where I think that maybe one of the main things here is to stop think of implementation. <laughs> it's much more activation. We yeah. have to activate people. And that's, then they are willing to try a new way. Mm. Where, of course, uh, greenhouses and that kind of, of ways to work uh, takes more time, more effort, uh, etc. But... It's a good way to implement things. Well, um, I, I, have you, what, is, what is so far your, um, the, the example that has inspired you the most uh, within this topic? Have you seen really good examples that generate really good results? Um, yeah, I do. 
Um, uh, for instance, we have worked with the Swedish uh, social insurance agency, and they are, at that time, they were 13,000 employees. They were um, uh, organized in, um, in the old way of, uh, of organizing, I mean, with uh, people the digital, people in the customer support, uh, etc. And now they organize themselves in, in customer, five customer journeys. All right. Uh, so they are totally redesigned and their, their uh, trust, because this was the challenge, that this trust from the Swedes were extremely low. And now they have raised this a lot since they started working with service design, but then slowly, slowly um, uh, also re reorganized uh, how they work. So, yeah, there, there was the question that I had in my mind. How long did this process take? Because I think a lot of people under, yeah, underestimate. Well, and I think three years is even a relatively uh, short period. I, I would say that until they, I mean, now they have gone from, on a hundred scale of 100, they have went from 52 to 62, which is really good for a, a, a public sector organization to just keep moving. But it started to show change in their numbers, in the trust numbers after three years, started to show some change. Yeah. So I would yeah. say three to five years. Yeah, it takes takes that time. Yeah, and uh, that that re requires uh, strong leadership from within the organization. Someone that really believes that this is the way to go, right? Strong leadership and strong. I mean, strong leadership over time because managers come and go. So it has to be built into the structure. Um, so, yeah, of course, strong leadership are needed, but also a commitment over time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, we can make a, a very nice bridge to the third topic. You just told that uh, they are organized around five customer journeys. And the final topic that I have here in front of me is called dynamic customer journey. Let me show you this one. Uh, and uh, what question do you make out of the what if? What if the customer journey is a dynamic change plan? Your dynamic yeah. change plan. Help, dynamic help change Daniel. Plan. Um, I mean, first, I mean, the customer journey is not a, a delivery. I mean, we as service designers have been thinking it's a delivery, but it is a change plan. It's, it's, it needs to be treated as the change hub. Hmm. for the organization and they have to be able to update it uh, when, when things change, when they have implemented things, uh, when things are changing from the, from the customer's perspective, they have to, we can't, um, uh, they have to have the ownership of it. And I think that's uh, one of the jobs that we as service designers have to, to manage. And mm. that goes back to the other two topics as well, that if they feel that they own the change plan and the customer journey and the breaking down into service map or service blueprint, it's an excellent change plan compared to the old processes where you have, you know, the the management process from the top, and then you have the main here, the, the set marketing, uh, manufacturing with delivery, and then we have some IT and H&R from, from, from the bottom. There are no customers in that uh, old ways of looking at processes, where I think that the customer journey and the breaking down of that into actions, that's the real change plan for organizations today. So uh, this also so strongly inter intertwines with the other topic you talked about, uh, about the question who owns or how is customer experience distributed throughout the organization. Yeah. I guess this is a really key issue here, right? Who, who owns the customer journey? Who is responsible for keeping it alive? Who is responsible for doing stuff with it? If you see it as a change plan, there has to be an owner. 
if it's just a delivery from a service design agency, who cares? Exactly. So just by have it as the change plan, have it as the something that always have to be updated. Who is responsible for keeping the, the map updated? Exactly. Okay, and when, when, when asking those questions, it has to be your responsibility. There has to be, a res and who is responsible for, for doing um, improvements in this customer journey? Yeah. And, I mean, one year have gone here, we haven't done anything, okay? Who's responsible for doing nothing here? So just by, by understanding that this map is the change plan, it will force organizations to create an ownership. Um, um, yeah, that, that will really lead forward, I think. I, I, I guess I was just thinking about the uh, ways organizations do research traditionally and doing the marketing research. They, those marketing research uh, reports are updated quite often, you know, maybe once yeah, a year yeah. or maybe even more often. And I don't see organizations doing that the same uh, within user research. So how often are service design agencies requested to update their latest user insights, right? It, it, it doesn't happen that often, but it, it should be treated the same. As in the market is changing, uh, people I are think changing. Among, among our clients now, there's a big, um, a lot of them have come up very, have come very far and they are really knowing how to handle things. Um, so we often get the question, how often do we have to update the customer journey part with this uh, situations, uh, customer situation, customer activities? And for one customer, we have to do it every third year and that's good enough. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the touch point level, I mean, things happen. New devices show up, uh, they reorganize uh, new IT, they implement a new IT stack, or whatever it could be. That level has to be updated on a more regular uh, basis, I would say. Uh, That's a great business model for service design agencies. I think we are going that way. Yeah. I think we are really leaving the project-based uh, uh, service inside agency and more going to, towards uh, a... Uh, customer centricity partner <laughs> with our tools, but we have to have those tools so they can own them. Yeah, and, and, and the tools for us that help to keep that customer journey dynamic. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And um, the, Daniel, I'm going to uh, close off the first three topics we talked about and um, ask you about it. If people approach you and ask, Daniel, I want, I want to get into service design, what would be your single most important tip for them? My tip would be that there's a lot of know-how to, 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 to learn about out there, both uh, on the web. They could look at your show, Mark. <laughs> that could be a good way. But there's a lot of good books, of course. Um, and uh, just... The first, I would say the first step is probably to just understand the different words so they could start to Google them and start to understand where could I find, find that. That would be the, the, the first level. But then the second level when it comes to education, uh, they start to show up a lot of good education here and there, I think. So I, I don't know if that's a good good answer to your question I, well if that would be your tip i guess uh it's really interesting get get yourself familiar with the language get yourself familiar with the uh, topics right yeah because if you don't have the language you can't google them and can't google them you can't find the interesting stuff so it's pretty and your simple. best tip probably is watch the show watch the show <laughs> and try to find out the, the, the important words so yeah keep going uh, and uh, now, I'm, now i'm curious um um about your big question. What is the question that keeps you awake these days? The big question is how to, uh, really create, um, an ownership of the change plan, which we have talked about earlier because mm -hmm. um, 
I think that's the key. Uh, if they start to own, and I mean, if you see behind me the 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 system that we have developed for keeping the uh, the customer journeys and the the blueprints. Uh, to create the ownership for the organization to continuously improve those, those, it's it's in line with that. We have developed that to give them ownership. Uh, where I think that they are looking at consultants to both for consultancy in different projects, but more to to show a best practice. Mm -hmm. Then it's better for organizations to start to learn doing things themselves. And the next step is to really have the the customer journey, the service map, service blueprints, uh, service ecosystem, whatever you call it, to have that as a core uh, platform in the organization. So this is what keeps me awake because there are a lot of enthusiasts out there in the organizations. They have seen this. They understand this. Um, in a few years, there will be much much more people understanding that uh, they have to have those competences themselves. Mm. That keeps uh, me awake. That keeps you awake. Interesting. Uh, maybe people have some insights on that and uh, share them in the comments, uh, I'd say. Yeah. Daniel, thanks uh, for your time. Um, uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll meet soon uh, in a different location. Uh, thanks for your inspiration so far. Yeah, thank you. Thank you too, Mark, for having me. Thanks. So what are your thoughts about the topics we've just discussed with Daniel? How do you make sure customer journeys stay dynamic? Share your thoughts in the comments. If you enjoyed this episode and like to see more interviews with service design pioneers, be sure to subscribe to the channel and check out some of the past episodes. With the Service Design Show, we help you to stay one step ahead by talking to the people that are shaping the service design field. For now, thanks for watching and see you in the next episode.